Welcome to Parenting Kids and Dogs 101, a limited series podcast for parents who live with kids and dogs, or plan to. I'm your host, Michelle Stern, the founder of Pooch Parenting. I'm not just a certified professional dog trainer and former teacher, I'm a mom too. In each episode of this series, I hope you feel like I'm chatting with you, one parent to another, about life with kids and dogs answering common questions my clients ask me, and giving you simple solutions to make your life easier and safer. I hope you'll subscribe and join me for the whole series. And don't forget to grab the accompanying workbook at poochparenting.net slash podcast workbook. Enjoy! In today's episode, I'll be talking about five mistakes that most parents with dogs make. Now, I know that might sound like an overgeneralization, but in my many years of specializing in working with families who have kids and dogs, I see certain mistakes happen over and over again. I want to start off by saying that these mistakes come with no judgment. However, most people don't know what they don't know. And so my goal of producing this podcast and focusing on this topic for our first episode is so that I can help you learn how to do better. So let's dive into the list. Mistake number one, many parents wear rose-colored glasses and they just assume that things will be fine. And oftentimes people get lucky and things are fine between their kids and dogs. They have a great relationship, their dog is happy, regardless of what kind of behavior their child has, whether or not their child is making lots of noise, has lots of friends over, maybe the child is grabby and the dog is what I call a unicorn and doesn't mind. However, many dogs do have strong feelings about interactions like these, and they don't always respond in a way that is safe. And oftentimes as parents, that's really frightening. Because at the end of the day, we really wish that our kids and dogs had a great, loving relationship. Mistake number two is not using management to create safe spaces for kids and dogs. Now, I totally understand that many parents want their kids and dogs to have free reign of the house and move around and go wherever they want. Unfortunately, sometimes... Kids approach dogs when they are sleeping or eating or chewing a bone, and a lot of dogs really don't like to be bothered during times like that, and sometimes they'll growl or possibly bite. Other times when management is really helpful is if you have a puppy who's running around chasing the kids. Maybe the puppy is biting the kids or scratching the kids, and we're developing fearful responses to the puppy, which is the opposite of the loving goal that you are hoping to have between your family members. So by using management, we can create what I call yes spaces. So the kids can be kids in certain zones of the house, the dogs can be dogs in certain zones of the house, and then maybe we have some other areas where everybody can interact together safely while you're watching very carefully. Now, this leads into mistake number three, which has to do with supervision. We often think mistakenly that just being in the same room is the same as supervising. And unfortunately, that's not the case. We always hear online and from our friends and veterinarians and pediatricians, don't leave your kids and dogs together alone. Make sure you're supervising. But nobody really tells you what that actually means. And so I am going to do that for you today because I'd like you to really understand. So at the end of the day, like I said before, simply being in the room with them is not enough. I can't tell you how many clients have told me stories about their dog biting their child right in front of them, even though they were in the same space as their dog and child. So what could have gone wrong? Why wasn't the supervision successful in this case? Likely it's because we're functioning and trying to manage a household and cook meals and fold laundry, and maybe we want to check our phone every once in a while. But unfortunately, if we do not have our eyes peeled, very focused, possibly even sitting between our kids and dogs, just being there isn't good enough. We need to do better. 
If you like what you're hearing so far, don't forget to grab the free workbook that comes with this limited podcast series. All you need to do is head over to my website, poochparenting.net slash podcast workbook. Mistake number four is not noticing or understanding dog body language. Body language is amazing. It is the most efficient way that dogs can communicate with us about how they're feeling and what they're experiencing. And when dogs live with kids, there's a lot to communicate. Maybe your child's tantrum was going on a little too long and the dog got stressed by the high-pitched noises. Or maybe your toddler got a new toy that makes noise and your dog is very uncomfortable while the noisy toy is moving across the room at breakneck speed. Or possibly your infant accidentally grabbed a fistful of your dog's coat and we didn't notice and your dog is trying to tell you, yikes, mama, this hurts. I need some help. Body language is remarkable and Oftentimes, it's very easy to miss some of the subtle signs. We'll be talking about more of these later in the series. I'm going to just give you one or two here that I'd like you to take a look at and see if you can notice your dog doing over time, maybe over the next couple of days. So my job for you is to start to track or notice if your dog is ever yawning around your kids. And if that's the case, I want you to think about what is going on. Now, why would I be asking you to look for a yawn? A yawn just might mean your dog is tired, right? Well, actually, a yawning dog often is a dog that's experiencing stress. So maybe your child is being extra noisy or speeding around the house, or maybe you're hosting a play date and the other child is doing some behaviors that make your dog uncomfortable. So I want you to take a look and see if your dog is yawning and notice what could be happening in those circumstances. Now, very similar to yawning, sometimes dogs flick their tongue or lick their lips. Again, this is a sign of stress, and I'm giving you that same assignment. I want you to keep your eyes open, see if you notice why your dog might be doing behaviors like this around your kids. Now, mistake number five may not be relevant to all of you, but I know it's relevant to many families. This mistake is not preparing your dog before you have a new baby. Oftentimes, people assume that if their dog is well-trained, knows how to sit and lay down and stay in place, that that's all they really need to do before their baby comes home. But in reality, there's a lot more to getting your dog prepared before your family grows. Oftentimes we wanna help our dog deal with flexible schedules because we know that you may not be able to feed your dog at 5.01 p.m. every single night because what if you have a dirty diaper to change? Or what if it's bath time? Or what if you need to be holding and rocking your baby to help offer comfort? Our dogs have to become more flexible with not only their schedules, but also with how much attention they're going to get. This is something I'm super passionate about, and I teach a lot of online classes and group coaching programs to help families with this. So feel free to reach out and message me if you think that might be something that could help you if you're planning on having a baby or adopting or using a surrogate. I would be honored to support your family. But don't wait. So just like you pick your pediatrician and maybe you set up a baby registry and you buy and install a safe car seat, I want you to add preparing your dog to that list of tasks. Okay, there are probably a lot more than five mistakes that many parents make when they have dogs, but I'm going to summarize again some of the top ones that I see when I'm working with families who are raising kids and dogs together. Number one, wearing rose-colored glasses and assuming they'll work it out and things will be fine. Number two, not using management to create safe spaces for kids and dogs. Number three, assuming that being in the same room is the same as supervising. Number four, not noticing or understanding dog body language. And number five, not preparing their dog before new baby. 
It's only natural for questions about our kids and dogs to arise from time to time, especially as our babies grow up and our dogs mature. And if I'm being honest, it's not really worth asking for free advice from friends or even online because you can't rely on the accuracy of the feedback you're getting. If you'd like to learn more about the Pooch Parenting Society, where I offer practical life and science-based tips and strategies, ongoing support, and a safe place to share, head on over to safekidsanddogs.com. From one parent to another, I see you, and I promise that you're not alone. Thanks for listening. 